Good morning and welcome to the David and David on Real Estate Podcast. We are today on episode number 131 and we have a special guest returning once again with us. We have Whiting from Open Room and I hope I said that correctly. Good morning and welcome to the show. Thank you very much, David. Hi, everyone. My name is Witeng Balu. I am the co-founder and CEO of OpenRoom.ca. What we do at Open Room is we aggregate court orders regarding tenancy disputes, and we make it searchable by the public. Yeah, this is residential landlord and tenant disputes, nothing to do with commercial landlord and tenant disputes. It's going to the landlord and tenant the tribunal, the board, and and sorting through these crazy decisions that I, I refer to as a kangaroo court all the time but it, it's great that there's that you're there's now a place to find them and to access them thank you very much it was a long time coming i did not think that this was going to be as big as it is and what it's gonna be as well because we're still working on more things behind it but it's fantastic to see uh it being spread like wildfire word of mouth yeah, I love and it. And I, because I'm referring to it as a kangaroo court. You're going to give us some some examples today of of some of the decisions that were that are probably surprising, but people have to be aware of. You know what type of decisions are being made there. Yes, you got it. Shall we jump in? Yeah, just just before we do, how many decisions do you have on your website currently? Uh, we have just north of fifteen thousand right now. And mainly we specialize in Ontario, but we do take orders uh, from all across Canada. Okay. And and put some context behind us. Like how many cases are being heard in the landlord tenant board a day, a week, a month? Any any ideas of what the numbers actually are? Like I, I, I'd love to yeah. know percentage wise of how many decisions are actually in your system. Like any idea? Yeah, if we're honing in Ontario right now, in 2022 to 2023, LTB comes out, uh, or LTB generally comes out with an annual report. But for last year, we were looking at landlord filed applications at about 73,000, and tenant side was about 50,000 or so. So altogether, that's roughly around what, one uh, 120,000 or so. Uh, so from open room perspective, if we look at 15,000 that we have, that is tiny. It's a tiny fraction. So for anybody listening or these big property management firms, big paralegal firms, if you've got something to contribute from a court order or tribunal order perspective, please help the community or right? submit it into the, into our system and help each other out. Absolutely. The more, the more information that we have in the database, um, the more the system's going to work. And, and, um, why don't, why, why don't we go ahead and jump into a couple that really stand out that I think the real estate industry really need to know about? You got it. So I'm going to share two specifically with you and our audience here. First one is where I believe uh, there is a bad landlord decision that occurred. Okay. So this is Singh and Dinara versus Salim. There are three cases inside Open Room at the time of us discuss discussing this right now. And this actually landed in the Superior Court of Justice, Divisional Court of Ontario. So it went to LTB first, then there was an appeal by the tenant, and this is what happened. So the landlord and the tenant has signed this fixed lease. Right? So tenant circumstances changed and they wanted to assign the lease to someone else. And per the RTA rules, you can't arbitrarily deny someone an assignment if they found a decent tenant okay, as a replacement. So tenant had five members of the family currently living in the unit. Tenant finds a first set of potential tenants, assigns, uh, wants to assign the lease to them, but the landlord denies on various reasons. The second time, tenant finds another set of tenants, uh, wants to assign the lease to them, and then the landlord denies based on number of family members. So the next, the second set was actually same number, five. Okay. So then when questioned about why this was the reason the landlord gave as a denial for accepting these next set of tenants, the landlord said they were advised by their realtor. So that's another story that, or like a conversation we can go down on advice given from realtors, right? Because not all realtors, as you know, David, uh, that they're not made equal. Okay. And then at this point, 
the tenant had to, uh, had to move out because they needed to go. They had other circumstances come out, but the landlord goes after the tenant for about two months of unpaid rent. Okay. Then the tenant looks deeper into the RTA and finds that this is a human rights violation because of the second set of tenants that were denied based on family members. So appeals to the divisional court on one, I do not want to pay the two months rent that they seemingly owed to the landlord because they moved out, but landlord denied the move in of this, uh, the second test set of tenants. So divisional court actually had given the opinion that the tenant should pay the tenants, um, or sorry, that the given the opinion to the tenant that the tenant should pay, uh, sorry, uh, the divisional court had given the opinion that the landlord should pay the tenants about 70, uh, 7,000 for costs. But I think that's only 50% of the actual costs that the uh, tenant actually incurred at the time of going to court and filing. So then, but there was an interesting piece to this is that either parties can then reappeal back to the landlord tenant board. Okay. So it had already been the appealed, uh, uh, had gone to the appeal to the divisional court, and then now it repealed that appealed back again. So fast forward to today, the case is now waiting for that next hearing at the LTB in early June, 2024. So it's still not over, still ongoing. Why I found this particularly interesting is that the landlord was seemingly in the wrong. And then they still want their $5,000 of unpaid rent, even though I think that they've spent way more now going to divisional and going to back to the LTB. So as I'm looking at this, it's really a warning to people saying, okay, you gotta be aware of why you're denying someone tenancy. Okay, I'll pause there, turn it over to you. Yeah, you refer to it as be, being an assignment of the lease. I'm wondering if it was really, was it really an assignment of the lease? Or were they trying to sublease? And were there, do you know if the rights would be different if they were subleasing it to the, to another group or as opposed to assigning their lease? Like, and then if there wasn't a real assignment, was the tenant being re requesting, I'm assigning, I found out their people to take it or I'm assigning my lease to them and then I want to be released of, of the obligations of the lease as opposed to it being a sublease where the, the original tenant's still on the hook, but now has a subtenant. I actually had the opportunity to speak to this tenant, okay, which is very interesting because many of the case, every single case inside the open room system has a story behind it. And I get to speak to many of these individuals. Uh, so this I know was for an assignment because the tenants did not want to come back to the property. And prior to trying to assign or find tenants, they had actually spoken to the landlord and said, I need to move and let's, uh, I'll, I'll find the next set of tenants. Cause that's what the landlord said is if you're going to move, you have to find another set of tenants that I approve and et cetera. So that's what the uh, the tenant had gone out to do. Okay, and it wasn't an issue about credit check of the new people. It was like, no, they've got five people. That's the landlord says too many people moving in. That's what was in the case, and that's what we know right now, or as the reason for denial. Yes. Yeah, there's so many multitude of issues here and 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 messages for for the real estate industry and for um tenants as as well as uh landlords here um you you know and and i think uh, there's so much misconception um from both sides as to what the rights are and legal uh, responsibilities and obligations and you know a lot of this is rooted in common law and in the rta as well right um and 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 david you can speak to this as well but you know, if if you're locked in a fixed lease, but you need to move, uh, it's your responsibility, or or you have the option to either keep paying your rent, and 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 not live in the property, or replace it. Uh, you know, replace that tenancy with with another tenant. Um, and I and I don't think that the landlord can arbitrarily deny. Um, and you can speak to this a little bit more than I can. What would be some of the instances where a landlord could arbitrate or could deny that tenant from coming in? Like what what check or or what has to exist for for you know for the for the landlord to say, no, you know what, the tenant that you chose to replace, I, I'm not allowing them to move forward. Yeah, was that part of was that described in the decision? 
at all? Like, were they giving, you know, comparables or reasons why the tribunal, when, when a tribunal would side with the landlord to deny an assignment request? Like, when is, when, under what fact situation is it reasonable? Like, the easy one for me to think on top of my head is, you know, they do a credit check on, on the new tenant and they've got terrible credit. So yeah, landlord can say, I'm not consenting to that tenant come or the landlord can say, I'll consent to that assignment, even because I'm getting a, a tenant I'm not real comfortable with, but I'm not releasing the original tenant from their obligation. So if this new tenant defaults, I'm still coming back after you or I want some security put up front or, or, or something like that. But like, was that part of the, the decision? No, there was no mention about credit checks. No. I don't even think that they got to the part of credit checks because it was just number of family. They were just vetting the very basic details before I even got to, okay, I'm going to go through further details of credit check, credit reports, bank statements, uh, et cetera. Yeah, it didn't get there. Okay, the fact there was five family members, I mean, like is this a one bedroom place and they're, they're concerned there's five people living in one room or, or what was the... You know, what type of place was this? Well, you know what? Does it matter? Because the current set of tenants also had five family members, which was what was very interesting to me when I was talking to the tenants because your current situation is five, yet the next set was denied on five. On that basis, that doesn't... Yeah. Unless the landlord said, you know, five is too many in that small unit and, and they trashed the place and they're doing damage there or they don't have some evidence to that effect. But to say I don't want five because my my realtor said five's too many like that like that, that's not going to stand up to to anything. Yeah, but I also want your listeners to know that I am not a legal professional and I don't review every single case that come into uh, the system because I've got a team that also helps me review. But these are some of the cases that I'm going to be discussing uh, this one and the next one where it's been highlighted or talked about in various communities and people are like, yeah, we think that this one's very interesting. You should look at it. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And, and, you know, I think landlord, uh, tenant, sorry, I think realtors also have to really understand some of these rules and obligations, because as you mentioned, this one particular case, you know, the realtor got involved and 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 started offering advice. And, you know, I, I love realtors to, um, you know, really be those professionals where they, you know, they're the landlord can lean on them for advice. But the, the realtor has to be very well educated and really understand these rules before offering that advice to their clients. And whenever you're not sure, then you have to refer your client to a paralegal or to a lawyer or to somebody who has the right experience to guide your clients on this journey. You know, don't just make an assumption and, and, and you know, offer your opinion if you're a realtor without being absolutely sure, without having personal experience, without, you know, really having uh, the right education or the right experience behind you before making that um, that advice. Absolutely. Offer. And David, how do your, how does your team learn about the tenancy side or the RTA today? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, we are very fortunate at my brokerage to have, uh, David Corman. Uh, we have had a 35 year relationship with his office. Um, and David Gorman does regular webinars uh, for my brokerages. And, and this is actually how uh, the David and David on Real Estate podcast came to be is, you know, during COVID, um, I, I remember there was a webinar that David uh, Corman did and and like the information was so fantastic. Like it was, it was great. And I said to myself, wow, like what an advantage for our realtors and our brokerage to have such uh, unrestricted access to, to David Corman and his professionals. And I said, you know what, this whole industry needs this sort of knowledge. Everybody needs to benefit from this. Uh, not just my realtors, not just my brokerage. Um, I just, you know, I, I said to myself, how do we make that happen? How do we get that information um, and, and, and really help the industry move forward? And that's, you know, how um, the David and David on real estate podcast came to be. Nice. Something that we do at Open Room, aside from just the court order side, is the training and the learning element is because what I go out there saying to the world is that many housing providers think that this is passive income, but you're running a business and you need to know what you're doing. 
do not be like me, who was that ignorant landlord who didn't know what I was doing. So now I go out there educating people on how to do it so you don't make the same mistakes as I do. So what we do for the community is learning, a training program where many realtors have actually taken the, the program with us. And we, we talk all the things about RTA, the LTB, fire code, uh, how to vet tenants, like there are different 20 steps, how to add clauses to the leases. Like these are really, really important elements that I wish I had known back in the day. Yeah, no, I, I, I've seen the training course on your website. I, I, I see, uh, um, you know, what what you guys kind of do and, and uh, it's fantastic. And anybody listening that really wants to level up and, and learn, I think um, knowledge is power. It all starts with education. Um, and it's 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 so important. I think reviewing these case laws that that we're doing right now is is also important because that puts the whole picture into practice and into perspective. And 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 you know you learn a lot from from reading case law and from really understanding um, you know how how things come to an end, how they start and how they come to a conclusion, and and kind of go through all the motions at the same time. I mean, it's yeah. hard. Some yeah. of these. Yeah, some of these cases are there. The legal jargon is still there. So for the average individual like myself, I I spent a, a multiple. I read it multiple times, uh, basically, and I still didn't fully understand it. But David Corman, do you want to comment? On that? No, I'm anxious to hear the second uh, case that you wanted to talk about because mm -hmm. it's always interesting to hear these fact situations and and how they get resolved. Yeah, and, and yeah. The other thing is, David, I always you know I always you always play the role that whiting is playing right now like you're always the one whenever we do these episodes you're always the one that is always describing these legal precedent cases so it's it's really nice to hear somebody else um you know from the kind of bring these to our attention as well except i'm not a legal professional <laughs> we also offer free content like on instagram uh david i think you uh david gorski you watch some of the content that i share out there yeah Okay, yeah, so absolutely. the next case uh, over here, there are 10 records inside the open room system today. Oh, sorry. Uh, let me share this with um, with you both. Okay. And this is Jamie Robertson and partner Patrick, oh, sorry, uh, Frederick Fred Perry. Okay. So Jamie Robertson and partner Frederick Fred Perry. These are the tenants. And these are repeat offenders, specifically in the Cambridge, Kitchener, Waterloo region. Wow. All right. So let's dive in. They specifically target new immigrant landlords who do not know the law or things that, they, uh, that they're supposed to do when it comes to vetting. So they will produce what is discussed in the case, all these uh, cases, as authenticity of their documentation that they've supplied to the housing providers. Okay, so the sets of 10 records, you will see that there are reviews, stays, requests to prolong the, the eviction. And there are two specific sets of landlords. There's Ayad and Fatin, who are owed right now about $43,000. I believe that this is still going on. And then Wilma and Alwyn, $18,000 in arrears. So they had already gone to the next set of uh, victims. So there's two for sure that we know about that were frauded or yeah. And what we have here is some members of the public have actually gone to hearings where Jamie would self-represent and there would be constant excuses to why they were unable to pay rent. They'd request for payment plans, but then never end up paying. So that's why we see high, high arrears. Okay. And why is this so interesting? For me, fraud documentation. So in the hearing adjudicators, you'll see it written out that they where they discuss the authenticity of the documentation supplied at the time of tenancy. And you'll see uh, some of the commentary is that Jamie will give reasons as to why those are legitimate documents. And then second is that I'm a mom and it hurts to see a fellow parent putting their kids in a situation where they have to be moving from one place to another because they're constantly getting evicted. I'll pause there. Any thoughts? Yeah, so it, it seems like like they're doing this deliberately. It's not like they're renting a place, they get in trouble, they lose a job, they can't pay rent. It's nothing. It's like like they're fraudulently 
they're committing a fraud at the time they're entering into the lease by providing false documents, moving in knowingly that they're going to default in the payment of rent, and they're buying time. Like, you know, good luck because they, they're playing the system. Good luck getting me out. We're going to be running up a big tab here. And by the time you get me out, we're, we're going to find the next place and start all over again. And like, this is a deliberate scheme, it seems like, by these people. Yes. Yeah, David, I think from the moment that they enter into the agreement, you can argue by looking at the history that the element of bad faith exists. Right. right. Like, I mean, from 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 the first intention is they want to fraud the system. And, right. you know, they're, they're doing that. And, and we can see them doing that through the history within, um, you know, the context of uh, of renting. And, you know, I the situation brings uh, brings to mind the fact that, like, if you're a landlord and you're going to the landlord tenant board and you have no idea what the history is with these people, you know, you're approaching that situation from a completely different context than if you actually know what the history is and, and you understand that people that what these people do and the fact that they're professional and uh, professional tenants trying to scheme the system and the element of bad faith is there from the start. Like you just approach that hearing uh, in a completely different context. You're not there, you know, feeling bad for them. You're there saying, you know, Mr. Representative, these are professional tenants. Here's the history. I have the documentations. I have, you know, 20 documents here uh, from other cases. I have history in the last 10 years. There's a constant history of these people scamming the system. And we need to work together to bring these people to justice. Uh, you, you know, it, it changes the conversation. And, and that's why I think, um, you know, that's why I know that the public is so excited about what you're doing. And, and we need this now more than ever. Thank you. And David, last time we had spoken on our last episode, you had talked about you not having the ability to check inside Open Room about your tenants that you have a non-payment of rent situation with. Same thing with the landlords that are owed 43000 right now. Had they had the opportunity to check for previous landlords owing from these tenants, I think they would have been well better, way more better informed about their rental decisions. Yeah, I think that's the key. You got to be able to use what you're providing now in open room for you say you know, do not rent to these people. Because once you do, they know how to play the system and and they can you can be the landlord they'll, and they'll they'll default to you and you can go to the tribunal and you can say, "Look, here's the history of these people. They keep defrauding from place to place to place and you get a sympathetic judge there say yeah you're right you know it's time for you to go you you have to pay your rent and they'll say oh but we need a we can make the payment give us a payment plan and some time to do it and then the judge will give them the time even if they have this history and you know they're going to default on that payment plan again and you got to go back to court again to try and get them out and and now it's the middle of winter and the judge is going to say you know I, I really should throw these people up but they got kids and i can't throw them out in the middle of february so i'm going to give them a six weeks to find another place and the six and they just keep going and it, no matter what their history is so the bottom line is don't rent to these people because once they're in you're never going to get them out and you're never going to get your money yeah use open I mean, room uh, don't rent to them <laughs> thank you very much uh i do want to point out that there are times when people are, are get a second chance and they will pay back and completely change their life around right and kudos and hopefully one day open room can help facilitate that change uh a change in behavior but when it comes to professional tenants and how do we define professional tenants for those who are listening or watching us it's these people know how to game the system and they know how what the delays look like to prolong to continue to behave in uh, criminal activity methods and that is unacceptable and we have to hold people accountable for these types of actions yeah i, I couldn't agree more do you rank some of these decisions or or is that uh, there like um, uh, a more defined database where, um, you know, people who really want to learn or, or really educate themselves about, you know, the must read cases 
um, to really learn how this uh, system works. Uh, it, do you do you have a place in your website where professionals or or both tenants and learn, landlords can go to like read the top twenty or the top thirty or the top forty uh, decisions that that are kind of like a mat, must read um, when it comes to decisions being made by the LTB? The short answer to that is no. But tell me a little bit about how that would work because. I would be highlighting certain cases, right? Which, and and maybe calling some people out like we did today to give a couple examples. I'd like to know why is that helpful? Well, you know, from, from a real estate perspective, I am always looking to educate myself, to educate my realtors. And I think by, by really learning about specific cases and understanding how the RTA applies to those cases, teaches people the real life scenarios that they really have to understand to be able to apply the law into context. And to me, um, if you can apply law to context, like, you know, there's like, if, if we're really going to be honest with each other, there, there's, you know, probably like 50 scenarios that happen all the time. And it's, they're not new. They're not different. They're not unique. They're just, you know, 50 kind of situations happen and the RTA and the landlord tenant board applies different rules to those 50 situations. So if if I can educate, you know, my realtors and the and, and the professional um, industry about, you know, how to handle those 50 situations, then we're going to raise the bar. Um, you know, we're going to create a better situation for both landlords and tenants. And, and, and uh, you know, we can... Uh, um, just just really help navigate those those situations by you know pointing out hey these are the top fifty RTA decisions read them know them uh, we can discuss them we can uh, you know apply RTA to specific situations and really start understanding how to navigate those situations. Ooh, I potentially discuss them as in commentary. Yeah, uh, very valid suggestion and uh, for both David's. I very much love when users of Open Room message in about requests or solutions that we should be thinking about or commenting on the way that we do things right now. Maybe it's not the best way, some challenges that they see. Uh, we take that back and we actually read every single comment, email, uh, even all the things that are happening on Reddit, Facebook, when people tag me in it. Uh, so I'm around, I'm looking, and I think this is actually a very valid uh, situation in terms of education right? Knowledge is power. I, I fully agree with that. But one thing I'll say that what we do have is the ability to look at paralegals and adjudicators. Mm -hmm. That is coming out soon. So it's like uh, one of the main problems that I was experiencing when I was uh, going through my case is that I thought I could self-represent as a housing provider. But as people know who have gone to the LTV, it's, it's you're way better when you have a paralegal or legal representative with you, okay? So as I was doing my research, I really didn't do much research. My thought was, okay, who would be best to represent me? I basically did a Google search. And then uh, I thought Jordan Newhoff, who, which is who I worked with, he's great by luck. I, uh, I found a great uh, paralegal, but my thought at the time was, he writes content, he coaches people, he must know what he's doing. And that's how I made my selection. But if we can turn it into a world where people can actually read some of these cases, find out how that paralegal represented that particular uh, party in the dispute, then we can make better decisions on who we want to hire as a legal professional. That's a great point. And I think we got to continue. We've got to have you back again, another episode, because we're not done. We got more, more to get into talking about the future. And, I, and we've also, I think in the next episode, we have to talk a little bit about, about things from the nasty landlord part of it too. We've been dumping a little bit on tenants so far, but, but uh, it goes the other way too. There's some landlords that aren't, that aren't very good too. I want to with that. And I got one real big question I got to ask you um, about it. Cause I think there's something you're deliberately not doing type of cases you're not talking about and not posting an open room. I want to talk about that, but I want that to be a teaser for the next episode. So we got to get it. Awesome. All right, guys. Well, listen, thank you so much for coming back and uh, what a great conversation. And thank you for pointing out those uh, two cases and join us next episode because we're really going to talk about the future, where we're heading and how, you know, open room is really going to, uh, I'm going to use the word revolutionize 
the tenant and landlord industry. So join us on episode 132 next time. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everybody.